Okay, I think we'll we'll go ahead and get started and people can trickle in uh, while I'm doing a bit of an intro. Just to say welcome and thanks for joining this session. I'm Mike Frost. I'm the product manager for DHS2 Tracker, which is a bit of a misnomer because actually we do all of the individual level data. So we also have the capture app, which is where events are being collected at this point, as well as all of the longitudinal data from Tracker Capture, which now is being put into the capture app. And there's, there's a lot going on there, but essentially that's kind of what we want to talk about today, which is individual data and why are we collecting it and why are we trying to get down to the point of service? A little bit about the challenges and the impact. Mostly, I won't be the one doing the talking. We have some great country experiences to share, um, but I wanted to give just a, a very brief uh, introduction here if my slide advances. Let's see. It advanced on my side. There it is. Okay. Okay. Um, I think if you're here, it's because you have some interest in this and maybe could already make these points yourself, but there is a kind of global push um, for data health, uh, for getting the data from the healthcare center, from the lowest levels, from having uh, the kind of longitudinal and individual data that you can use to do many different things than we're able to achieve from the aggregate reporting and, and monthly style of reporting. Some of the things people talk about are that we could reduce the data burden, which the first point, public health is a data monster. It wants all of the data. It doesn't care about any other part of health except for its particular part of health, and it thinks everybody should be the reporter for that. So what we've done is turn, of course, the entire world of clinical people into reporters for public health. Uh, and it's become quite a, a monstrosity, actually, at the point of service. Any of you that work at or have worked at or know the care providers, they're spending way too much time just filling out these reports for us. You've all seen a million pictures like this. Just yet another one. This was from two months ago in, in Laos. Essentially, all of the data is there at that site. That's where all of the health interactions are happening, either there or from a community health worker. Whoever is actually seeing the client is the one that has all of the information that the national program wants, that the WHO wants, that the global donor agencies want. And so there are a million different ways they've devised to make these poor people report. Supposedly, we can reduce that if we're able to actually just capture the clinical interactions, if you're able to collect some of the minimal data points that are needed to calculate all of your indicators. Potentially, that also gives us better data quality uh, when you're not having the human uh, entry process of going from the register and then tallying them up into your weekly summary and tallying those up to put in a monthly report, which you're then sending to another person who's going to enter into the computer and maybe they're doing some additions. So, so many possibilities for human error in that process that we have an assumption that we can get better quality data if we capture it one time when the interaction happens and would be able to reuse it. And we're talking, of course, we're, we're talking a lot about health here, but this is true across every industry. Uh, we've all heard about big data and all of the interest in Facebook selling your life to advertisers this is the same movement, actually. You need the individual discrete information in order to do better analyses and be able to do better predictions and be able to better understand complex behaviors. So you want that granular data. Um, so, yes, supposedly giving us better data quality, supposedly giving us better data analysis. So why wouldn't you do point of service? Well. Probably the exact same reasons. Does it actually reduce data burden? Not usually, not the way that it gets designed. Everybody wants, oh, we're gonna be down there in the clinic. We can get every piece of information that they possibly have. And you go through the design process and you end up with some monstrosity of a data collection form. So it doesn't reduce the burden. You didn't even take the paper away. Now they do extra data entry because they enter it all into their individual point of care uh, data forms and tracker. The data quality, Probably not very good if they don't have the time to actually do all of the things that they're being asked to do. We have seen many countries over and over. We have healthcare workers that are now taking weekends and extra time to try to digitize all of this reporting that they first captured on paper in the week and that they used to just be able to send as a paper report, but now they're being asked to also enter it into another system. Data quality, probably going down, not as much reporting probably causing problems. The data analysis, all these sophisticated analytics that we're doing with tracker data, 
hardly existent. There's not a lot of new sophisticated ways to actually triangulate the data and have better answers to public health problems. We mostly are generating the same global indicators that we've always had. Uh, we're just doing it from the individual data now. And when we query the individual data directly, it actually slows down all of the analytics. And so maybe now you're having a harder time at getting your reports. So again, many different reasons why maybe not to do it. I, as the tracker manager, believe, of course, it can be done and it can be done well and it can have the impact that we think it should. This is an area that's in its infancy across sectors as well about how to get at this data. If you try looking at the best research about what the impact is of collecting in this way, it's shifting a lot all the time. There's also, of course, undecided uh, norms around data privacy. There's questions about at what level to save and store data for how long. So there's a lot going on in this field. So my, my hope is that all of us that are here are here because we're interested in the potential of it. We're all learning together. We think that there are ways to do it correctly. And we have a couple of experts here to share with us today. A couple of my uh, colleagues that didn't know we were going to organize this session and went ahead and submitted something relevant for it anyway. So Shristi Rijal is going to speak to us first, a monitoring and evaluation specialist from, hang on, I'm gonna skip a couple of these, uh, from FHI 360 will be reporting to us a bit about the experience in Nepal. I had a second presenter from FHI 360 who I don't think has been able to make it. Um, so we will probably miss that, which maybe gives us a bit more time to discuss. And then we will have uh, Mohammed Baniole from the Palestinian National Institute of Public Health that will present with us. So I will stop talking and I'll turn it over to Shristi if you want to share your screen. Yeah, thank you so much, Mike. Yes. Uh, let me share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay. Uh, a very warm good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone present physically and virtually in the DHIS2 Annual Conference 2023. I, along with my colleague Upendra Shrestha, are going to present on strengthening community action to achieve ending HIV 2030 in Nepal. This is our experience of using DHIS2 in HIV prevention, testing, treatment, care, and support program in Nepal. Uh, Nepal has con concentrated epidemic of HIV among key population, such as female sex workers, people who inject drugs, men having sex with men, and transgender people. Since 1993, FHI 360 and currently EPIC Nepal project uh, with the support of PEFAR USAID in a coordination with uh, National Center of AIDS and STD Control is working in six out of seven provinces of Nepal, covering 37 districts out of 77 districts and uh, comprising of 387 municipalities. In addition, the project has been providing technical support to 56 ARD sites. The services are delivered to key population led 26 city clinics and 25 dispensing sites for continuum of HIV care. Um, the community-led approaches for the HIV prevention activities is crucial for averting new transmission for HIV infection, early diagnosis of HIV cases in the community, and their early enrollment into the treatment. Um, their roles in treatment retention Monitoring the treatment progress is also equally important to end HIV epidemic in the country. For the successful and effective community mobilization, there is an immense importance of accurate, timely captured, and complete person-centric data, followed by the analysis and its interpretation. These robust person-centric data is fundamental for the uh, differentiated service delivery of HIV. The overall data use will eventually support in preparing action plans on daily, weekly, and monthly basis to improve the quality of HIV services. It also guides to meet the targets uh, focusing in the high-risk area and population. 
Uh, FHI 360 Nepal had been using management information system based on Microsoft Access. You can see the screen over there. Uh, though all the implementing partners used to update the client's record in daily basis, the data could not be extracted instantly to track the progress, analyze it, and interpret to take the programmatic decision. Um, the database had major limitations, such as delay in receiving complete data at the head office level, delay in identification of programmatic gaps, and constraints in person-centric data linked with the continuum of services. The project face, uh, faced uh, problems for day-to-day -day progress monitoring and planning at the implementing partners level. Uh, realizing the need of person-centric data at real time, FHI 360 Nepal through USAID PEPFAR support did an assessment at its implementing partners for the readiness of using DHIS2 as new recording and reporting system in 2018. The recommendation from the assessment steered to the adoption of the system. Then the customization of DHIS2 was carried out, which led to the development of Mero data, meaning my data, to capture person-centric HIV prevention specific data. The implementation of the system started with the capacity building of the end users and admin level users. FHI 360 also supported the implementing partners for a required system and capacity of adaptation of DHIS2 and provided technical backstop to guide them. This was the first time DHIS2 was customized in the country for HIV prevention program. Uh, currently, there are 60 users from implementing partners, city clinics, and ARB dispensing sites across the countries using the system to Epic Nepal project. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Upendra Shrestha. I'm working as a senior uh, monitoring and evaluation specialist in Epic Nepal, FSI 360. Okay, after uh, the customization of DHIS2 for HIV prevention program, Mero data has been an asset to capture granular client level information, service level details, and geographical mapping of each client. This has supported in monitoring HIV program throughout the continuum of care. The person centric data supports in segmentation of clients based on their risk behavior, service use, or DNR. Uh, this categorization enables uh, community-based supporters and peer navigators to advocate for HIV screening to all the clients who are at high risk of HIV, living or working in high prevalence areas. Okay, uh, this cycle shows uh, the process of community mobilization using DHIS2. In each implementing partners, uh, monitoring and evaluation officer carry out daily monitoring on the programmatic uh, progress, including the reach of people with HIV prevention messages, number of clients diagnosed, clients linked to HIV care services, and those who started ART. The community-based uh, supporter and peer navigators are mobilized at the field based on the gaps uh, among certain key populations or in certain uh, geographical areas determined. At the partners level, staff carry out weekly as well as monthly programmatic analysis which is discussed uh, among the field staff so that they can intervene. Uh, followed by it, the execution of the plan is done and reflected for long-term implementation. Uh, these are uh, glimpses of visualization of key indicators and their uh, cascades. They are uh, uh, analyzed and discussed with the uh, staffs of implementing partners on periodic basis. Further, the mobilization of community-based supporters uh, prepare program coverage map, uh, documenting their community efforts in daily log sheet and service record forms accordingly. Uh, similarly, uh, these are some more examples of how uh, inbuilt application in uh, metadata is helpful for community strengthening to deliver quality service to the client. This is the dashboard uh, prepared by the implementing partners 
which provides periodic achievement at different organization unit uh, level against the set targets. It helps uh, to monitor and review the performances. Based on this dashboard, the implementing partners and staff from FSI 360 conducts periodic uh, meeting for improving the plans for community mobilization and replanning the strategy. Uh, the visualization, uh, you can see the visualization. Uh, the visualization helps uh, community-based supporters and peer navigators to monitor the progress of HIV prevention, care, and support services at their uh, individual level. It makes easier uh, them to understand the programmatic gap at the reaching pockets. Okay, uh, the line list of the client has been helpful community mobilizer for identification and prioritizing the client for the services. Follow-ups among the higher uh, risk population has been efficient with this event report. This has been effective to advocate uh, services like pre-exposure prophylaxis services uh, among high risk of HIV populations. Similarly, uh, regular follow-up for the PLHIV in the denial of ART and those who are with unsuppressed viral load result has been possible. Okay, uh, the scheduling feature. The scheduling feature has definitely provided the benefit to the case managers, uh, those who are stationed at city clinics in each implementing partners to conduct a regular follow-up uh, for the services. Uh, Metadata has been uh, vital for not only in uh, data recording and reporting, but for the use of the data in evidence-based planning and education through the community-based workers. They contribute for capturing uh, granular client-level information, service-level details, and geogra uh, geographical mapping of each client for real-time data that leads to action. This has supported monitoring HIV program throughout the continuum of care and facilitating to provide differentiated service delivery based on the status of clients and their risk behavior through community-led approaches. So in a nutshell, this person-centric data management system has strengthened the implementation of uh, evidence-based community action to support ending HIV by 2030 in Nepal. Following this success, uh, success the model has been adopted by the uh, national system as well to build uh, and strengthen one national HIV information system in Nepal. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, do you have any questions? Sorry, we were just we were on mute. All right, I'm trying this again. Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. I have a lot of computers in front of me. Um, thank you so much. That was uh, excellent. And I know that we, we have a bit of extra time. So I was going to see if anybody wanted to, to ask questions either from the audience or online. I've got the chat pulled up as well. Does uh, anybody have any questions for the, the project before we move on and talk a little bit about Palestine? We can also come back to questions at the end, but yes, please. I'll bring you the microphone. We'll see if they can hear us. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, obviously, the intervention um, um, in HIV obviously means that um, you probably have a lot of clients and patients that are very concerned with um, anonymity and, you know, in key populations. So how uh, were you able to, to solve that challenge? I guess, you know, from one hand, uh, um, uh gathering you know granular level data and from the other hand you know trying to keep the the privacy and anonymity of uh, of the individuals secured uh, we have been practicing uh the use of uic a unique identifier code uh, so that they can uh, track uh, all the data using the unique identifier codes okay. is that clear Yes, and maybe a follow up on that. So you you showed the line listing, for example, as a key possibility for community level follow up. 
Can you talk a little bit about at what level those line lists are made available and who might have access to them, just as one of those areas of, of considering anonymity? Actually, the line list is uh, uh, available for those who are uh, like community uh, supporters and those who are uh, care providers. No? And uh, beyond that level, the line list uh, is not available or uh, they, they can only uh, see the client codes. And for those who really uh, providing uh, services to, at the field level, they can only assist the uh, details of client so that they can easily uh, uh, like recognize the client and all to get all the details of clients. Great, thank you. Uh, more questions in the audience? Did I miss any online? Just checking. So maybe I would ask one more and, and others from the audience can, and then we'll move on. But uh, I was wondering if you could could maybe say some of the, the biggest challenges that you had in carrying out this project. It, it looks like it was a lot of work, very well thought out. Um, what, what maybe was surprising or challenging that you would recommend people prepare for or plan for? Uh, like the uh, challenge is like uh, in the uh, community level, um, everyone will not get the uh, internet access. Uh, so what we did was we tried to manage uh, internet access in all the implementing partners. And um, like uh, we were trying to um, buy, like uh, expand it at the field level as well, uh, as well. but uh, because of because they are also uh, implementing partners who are working at the border level and uh, there are issues of internet. Uh, so it was kind of difficult for us uh, to, um, to run uh, everyone uh, to run the uh, run DHIS2. Uh, similarly, uh, also, there are some uh, because the, it's a key a key population led organization. Uh, it was difficult us to capacitate um, the capacitate everyone. Uh, so we have been doing a lot of a uh, wide range of capacity building, uh, capacity strengthening uh, trainings, and uh, there is a lot of turnover as well. Uh, so uh, it is. Uh, uh, it, it is difficult uh, to spend a lot of resources for capacitating them. Uh, these are the major challenges that we had faced uh, while implementing it. Uh, the name is Farshad Farshad Far. I am a scientist in NCD department WHO headquarter. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I really uh, liked it. Uh, just a question, what are the measures that you are going to take to make sure that the data quality remains as a reliable and uh, valid data? Um, first, uh, at the field level, what we do is uh, we do the verification uh, using the log sheets that we had mentioned in the presentation. Followed by it, we have been carrying out a data quality assessment uh, in based on the need, like um, if they, the data quality is very poor, then we do it uh, three times in a year, or if it's good, uh, based on the scale we do annually. And, uh, uh, and rather than that, than that, we also have been using Power BI to see um, like about further visualization and to check uh, the uh, quality of the data. Okay, besides that, uh, we, are, we also do record the service uh, in hard topic forms as well. So as a, as a source uh, form of uh, this uh, system, E, e forms. So, on the basis of uh, those uh, field up hard copies, we regularly uh, and periodically conduct uh, conduct data quality assessment, uh, data verification, so so that we can uh, ensure the uh, quality of data. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Zaman Siam. I'm the regional advisor uh, for CRO region from WHO. Uh, sorry, I'm asking you maybe. Um, a kind of an archaic question, but um, just if you can reflect on your experience, please, about um, the ethical part of it, the sort of the, let's say, patient or client consent for you recording and registering personal data, if you can give us some insight into that, because 
the common understanding, for instance, we have from facilities like inpatient facilities that this comes naturally with the registration sometimes, and it's a kind of an embedded sort of practice. But when you are doing outreach and community-based sort of work, how are you getting the client consent that you would register their data and, and process it? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for your query. Uh, yeah, the confidentiality of, and privacy has been like uh, maintained in uh, capturing the e electronic uh, in electronic form. So we basically we uh, we obtain uh, clients' consent uh, uh, during our uh, registration. So at the at the, uh, at the time of registration, we uh, like explain uh, our uh, various uh, wide ranges of services they uh, can uh, utilize from our organization. And at that time, uh, if a client is uh, like uh, client convinced and uh, give uh, the consent for the service utilization, we uh, basically we explain all the procedures and uh, take consent uh, during the service enrollment period. And we also like uh, we also like uh, uh, inform inform them about their uh, privacy and confidentiality and about the we also uh, rec uh, keep their records in a locked cabinet. So we basically we ensure the confidentiality and privacy of the clients. And adding to that, uh, we have uh, different uh, users for in every implementing partners who have their own password code, uh, code. And we tell them that if any of the staff leave the, uh, leave the organization, they have to change the pass password so that uh, the information is not leaked anywhere. Uh, and, uh, and also, uh, uh, also, the, all the paper based are have been ensured that they are kept safely, uh, and um, uh, and and we ensure they are maintained uh, with a perfect uh, confidentiality and privacy. It. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Pendra and Shristi, for for sharing with us. It was uh, very interesting. Uh, we'll we'll move on now, but maybe first a round of applause. I don't know if you'll be able to hear, but. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mohammed, I think we'd be happy to turn now to, to you. I think, yes, we can see your screen. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mike and colleagues uh, for having me to share our experience in Palestine. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, we hear you fine. Yeah, yeah that's great. And you can see the screen as well. Uh, so, um, just um, uh, I'm uh, Mohammed uh, Bani Audi. I'm from uh, Palestine, uh, working in the World Health Organization as a health system officer, and I'm leading several public health uh, informatics initiatives in the primary healthcare setting in Palestine. Today, we will uh, we will share our experience in Palestine for using the DHIS2 on large scale implementation. And really, this is the, uh, the unique experience of utilizing the DHIS2 on large scale implementation, not only on the HMIS, the routine statistics, but also on the tracker as a patient record. And really, uh, we started in 2016 uh, by utilizing the DHIS2 as a tracker patient base for the mother and child uh, care. Uh, then we decide to add more services, uh, including the family health and other uh, health services inside the primary health care. In this presentation, we'll go quickly for the main modules uh, that related to the EHR because we uh, we we um, proposed like a new uh, like uh, a term to be used in, inside the Ministry of Health. Uh, to consider it li not like a tracker, but also it's like an EHR uh, when we utilizing the family health record. Uh, so we are utilizing all health services inside that record. So it's an EHR. So that's why we will repeat this term. Uh, then we will we'll focus on the issues that could be replicated from Palestine experience to other countries and the take home message. Uh, uh, now- Mohammed, maybe- 
Just quickly to say, uh, we, we're seeing your slides in the slide mode, but if you wanted to put them in present mode, uh, just, just oh, wanted yeah. to pull that out. Sorry, yep. Now? Yes, well, now yeah. we're seeing the preview mode, actually. Okay. Yeah. It, was, it was working okay the other way as well. So if, uh, if it's something about dual screens, then it's fine. You can just go back. But right now we're seeing them in the preview or like your own presenter view. Oh, okay, so let me present it. Um, again. Now does it work? No, that's back to the presenter mode. I think it's maybe best if you just go back to your original setting. That's okay. Oh, okay. Where this works also. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. That's, I got it. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about uh, that. No, don't worry. Uh, so now in this, in this slide, uh, you can see the level of implementation. This is the key fact on the implementation. In Palestine, now we have 380 clinics are using MCI registry as a tracker. Uh, 50 clinics are using uh, the uh, tracker on the family health record, including uh, uh, child, adult, and CD, GP, specialist visit, laboratory, radiology, drugs immunization. Uh, we have 14 districts are using EQMIS as a routine statistics. 14 districts are using case-based surveillance system for the communicable disease. 14 districts are using mammography registry as a tracker. 14 districts are using dental uh, registry as a tracker. 14 districts uh, use it for gender based violence. And uh, really, this is a unique model where we have Ministry of Women, Ministry of Interior, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Education. We have more than four core stakeholders are using the same tracker for reporting on the uh, gender based violence. Uh, we have also the RTA. This is also a unique model because we are utilizing the road traffic accident, not only registry, not only for the Ministry of Health, but also for the private hospital, NGOs hospital, and governmental hospital are reporting on the same tracker DHIS2. Uh, before that, it was yeah, everyone, they send their data to the uh, to, to the MOH, then they compile it and do the data entry again into one system for utilization. Currently, all of them are using the same uh, uh, system for reporting. And also, we have 14 districts using the health education platform as an event. So we have event program, tracker program, and uh, aggregated uh, program. Uh, in fact, we were driven with the um, um, National Health Information System strategy, which is published on 2013. And part of that is to improve the information product and to improve the surveillance as well. So that's why we focused on all mentioned uh, surveillance. And this is an important uh, and really a successful recipe uh, uh, in the implementation to be driven with the counterpart and government uh, priority rather than the donor priority at that time. So you can success and provide real implementation and success implementation. Here's, for example, one of the requirement document that we share it with the Ministry of Health to get the clearance before uh, start the configuration for the family health, what included inside the family health. So we started with that document. It takes time from us, but it helped us a lot in the implementation because uh, we can, we considered uh, the stakeholders' uh, uh, the requirements rather than our uh, perspective. Uh, and in this slide, you can see what type of, of uh, um, programs we implemented. We have a tracker program. Uh, we have now currently uh, 100,000 of patient record of PHC. Now it's available for utilization. We have aggregated the program. The aggregated program uh, now is the only source that the Ministry of Health is using and relying on it to publish the annual report. And really, this is an achievement because before that, they use a paper based and Excel and Microsoft Access to generate the uh, routine statistics. Now they are using the uh, DHIS2 for generating the annual report. The event program, uh, for example, including the uh, School of Health Services and other activities is provided as an event, uh, not aggregated and not uh, patient-based. 
And we have also like a metadata and health data dictionary. We have more than 4,000 data elements now available in the system uh, from all paper-based was collected and uh, revisited and reviewed uh, uh, and build it, configure it inside the DHIS2. And these data elements now can be like a ready-made uh, uh, data dictionary to be used in the future for the data interoperability between primary care and secondary care. And we also have a KPIs and dashboard, and I will show, show you a live demo. Uh, in the last five minutes about the type of indicator are generated from the uh, system. Here is the patient journey through the um, uh, FHIS, the Family Health Information System, or what I called at the beginning the EHR because we compiled all requirements and services, uh, make it digitalized and available uh, in the primary healthcare setting as uh, from one URL, from one username and password, you can log in from one place so you can see all tracker programs in one place. And really this, this is also a unique because in the other countries we noticed that they use, for example, a program for the child, another program for the mother, another program for the vaccination, and another program for the dental health. So it's like a silo and vertical programs. But here in our design, we consider all program in one uh, place and uh, that's include birth registry, death registry. All of this information now are longitudinal where the person start the journey from the DHIS2 and finish the journey uh, in death cases uh, uh, in the DHIS2. And this is a snapshot from the uh, system about the indicator of the diabetes, uh, hyperdyslipidemia, uh, hypertension, etc. So this is a real snapshot from the system and I can show you also from the uh, system. This is the as is design before we started. It was like, as I mentioned, a silos and every tracker has um, a, a separate entity. Then we compile it together in this uh, model, as you see, electronic record, EHR. So all, it, all um, patient-based records are available now in one instance. So you can uh, link it with, uh, with other data sources, uh, with Ministry of Interior, with EMR in the hospital, with, with, with insurance uh, 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 federation or insurance uh, uh, companies, uh, with the HMIS, the routine statistics. And all of these um, uh, records now are available uh, to be linked with the governmental uh, network, what is called the x road in Palestine. Uh, it's like an intergovernmental online service for the Palestinian government. So all other ministries, they can connect and interconnect it with the same network and share the data with the privilege and uh, considering the privacy and confidentiality issues. And all the program are mentioned here, already be, be, I listed before a while. What is replicable from what I mentioned before? We have um, uh, seven things we can replicate from Palestine. The government, the governance experience, user, user involvement, COT experience, end of user, uh, end user training, implementation, metadata package, and system configuration. I will go quickly for them. For example, just to make sure that the implementation is, is working, you can see the, the, the upper part of the iceberg. And this is the implementation. But in fact, at the end, and that's why I use that metaphor because really it's helpful just to show the level of complexity and the level of workload uh, at the uh, bigger part of the iceberg where we have uh, users involvement and early buy-in. Uh, we have an expert committee from formulated from different technical uh, committee from the Ministry of Health to communicate with them. Uh, tens of, of technical meetings and sensitization meetings were held just to make sure that they are involved and they are part of the design. Uh, we have the infrastructure installation. We have more than uh, 2,500 network points and more than 2,000 PCs are distributed. Uh, the software configuration, we configured more than 4,000 data elements inside the system. And as I, I mentioned, the system sensitization meeting training, uh, end of user training, including 1,500 uh, end users. So all these um, 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 uh, efforts uh, are really essential and crucial for a successful implementation to see the upper part of the iceberg. 
in, in picture, just one slide for each replicable experience. This is the starting point of governance, how to do governance for the digital transformation and establish what is called country team. And really this is recommended from the UIO to have like an internal team uh, to, to, to maintain and sustain the DHIS2 in the Ministry uh, of Health. This is an essential for follow up for the maintenance uh, of implementing the system. And uh, as you see the picture here, we implemented that um, uh, team from the Ministry of Health and from the uh, uh, PNIPH, the Palestinian National Institute of Public Health. Um, another thing could be replicated from Palestine is the, the experience of feedback and acceptance. Really, it's early, early involvement is the co for the core care provider in design and development of family health record. Really, it's very important to have tailored solution by and minimize resistance to change when it comes the implementation. Uh, TOT training, the, really, this is an important as well. Before going to the field, before going to the clinics or hospital, you have to, ha to, to have like a system champion. You have to select some people nominated from official uh, um, side. Sorry for the, 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 the voice. So the, those nominated people will be like a system champion and the messenger, uh, like a messengers in the field to promote and advocate for the, for the system. Another thing uh, that should be also uh, yani, replicated, if it's done well, the end users training. Uh, um, so we uh, invite all stakeholders, uh, all end users, doctors, nurses, lab technician, radiology technicians, pharmacists, all of end users to, to, and give, give them like an opportunity to, to have what is called hands-on training or digital traffic, feedback, orientation session and uh, readiness for the implementation. All these factors really are crucial and essential for making the implementation successful. Otherwise, it's not like, uh, you know, other training, it's like uh, just to give the slides for them and you have to go back to the home, no. The implementation, it's very complex a process. You have to start from the country team, sensitization meeting, TOT training, district training, and end users training. And finally, the real implementation. The real implementation really means that on-site training, you have to go uh, for the clinic with the end users for one day at least one the uh, support, make sure that they are dealing with the computer uh, properly, they, they know, uh, because some of them, they have a computer literacy issue. So you have to make sure that the system is really implemented and how to reflect all papers, as you see in the table, inside the system properly, and to build the trust between the system and uh, the end uh, user. What are the main challenges? Really, there are many challenges, finance and budget, team formulation and governance because uh, governance because this is not an easy uh, issue you have to have an official meeting and official political will from the government uh, so requirement management stakeholder involvement interoperability uh, issue uh, change management issue change request management how to manage all requests coming from the field uh, in a proper way without neglecting the end users um, uh, willingness and requirement because at the end it, it will backfire on you uh, in the future and they will uh, uh, show resistance to change the uh, software and and uh, finally continuity of technical support this is essential for making the system sustainable uh, really this is uh, the take home message from the, the the large scale implementation and really i put the tortoise and the, the uh, the rabbit, as you see, sometimes the decision maker like a rabbit, a rabbit and the, the implementation goes like a tortoise because uh, everyone they have their own uh, priority. So it, it's very important to make sure that both of them have a clear understanding and a clear uh, vision about how the implementation uh, should be like. And it's not like a shake and bake process or like plug and play. So it's very complex a process. So you have to establish a clear vision and goal, political will, engage a stakeholder, 
to have a national consensus and the plan for data privacy and security very well, invest in training and support, monitor and evaluate the system, consider interoperability in your mind while you are proposing the, the use case for the user and continuous improvement. Finally, just um, I don't know if I have a time uh, for two minutes, uh, just uh, Mike. Yes, go Can ahead. Yes. My, yeah, yeah, good. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, great. And this is the uh, uh, really the, this is the tracker capture. As you see, uh, you can see the uh, now the list of programs that are already built from one place. This is really one of the big achievements. Make all the program navigated from one place. We have a central registration program, accounting and the pricing, cause of death, child program, family health file, immunization laboratory, mammogram, pin approach, pharmacy, and radiology. For example, if you need to register uh, uh, anyone in the primary health care, no need to register from several vertical uh, tracker programs. From one place, you can register the, 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 that person and add, add the reason purpose of the visit for that visit. Then you will move for, for example, the family health file. Inside the family health file, you can add the history, and you can see the previous visit, as you see here, family history and um, uh, surgical history, patient history, uh, and other modules. Uh, this is the nurse record. You can uh, add a doctor record. Once you save it, you can add the ICD-10 and the doctor note, the present illness, and a systematic review, uh, physical examination, management plan, and based on the management plan, the system will guide you for the rest of the process. You can also make a laboratory test for that uh, patient. In a few seconds, you can make the uh, lab request. Uh, really, uh, utilizing such uh, data systems, and it is, I, I mentioned that to the conference in now in the University of Oslo, just to show you that the data is too like, uh, uh, you can modify it based on your uh, resources and based on your, um, uh, sorry, Mike, just uh, one second. Uh, sorry, Mike, it was like uh, just an urgent uh, thing to, 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 to response. Okay, so this is the lab, uh, uh, the lab test. You can do the lab test quickly. As you see, for example, fast blood sugar, random blood sugar, uh, cholesterol, et cetera, and the lab technician will fill the result. And the same thing you can do for the, the pharmacy. You can make the uh, uh, pharmacy from here, from the, the same place. As you notice, you can make a pharmacy uh, request based on the, uh, for example, this is the most frequently requested medication for the patient. Very quickly, you can uh, make a request, for example, for the metformin, for aspirin, for paracetamol, et cetera, and uh, uh, dose frequency. And once you click here at the right feedback, you can see all requested uh, uh, drugs. Then finally, the doctor will return back to the family health file and write, final conclusion. All transactions I did now, you can see it here in the dashboard. And this is this is one of the big achievements that, okay, all these transactions, it's not only for clinical use, it's for statistical use as well. So you can see, for example, the NCD program, and in the NCD program, this is not routine statistics, not MIS or aggregated. This is a, a patient-based, uh, data that generated from the patient records and presented as a, um, uh, presented as a, a dashboard here. We have another dashboard for the QMIS, but really this is uh, uh, generated from the patient record. We have also for the financial report, all revenues are coming from all lab test pharmacy and other are coming to you. Uh, are coming from a uh, different transaction in the system, you can also see it. We also have like a dashboard for the training material to make one centralized library. So 
for the end user and to mitigate the risk of uh, ma making the end users are lost in the field. So they can go for the video, they can download the, uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the manual, as you see. Can you see the manual, user manual? It's a PDF. Yes. Yes, we oh, see it. Great. So all resource material also are available here for the, the child program and all other programs now. Hundred thousand of indicators available now for them. And one of the I I see it's like a creative solution for them. We we cannot promise the end, the end user that we cannot promise them. Uh, we have a, a stock management system, but we have a workaround solution where we added all dispensed drugs for them in one list. So they can compare it, they can present it on daily basis, in the, in the, on daily basis, and then they can use it for count, how to do count for the current stock. And really they were, uh, uh, they, they like that uh, workaround solution. Uh, the laboratory, the same, so the other programs, we have the same thing. Maybe one of the important things that I, I have to mention about uh, the, the, this uh, HR, IMRO, the uh, uh, Eastern Mediterranean um, Regional Office, requesting us officially that let us find a way to make this uh, 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 data system uh, available for other countries to, make, to deal with EHR like uh, uh, in the DHIS2, not only for routine statistics, but for the treatment of, of the end users. Okay, it's not linked with the pharmacy and the stock and inventory in, 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 with the APIs yet, but at least it gives more than 95% of BHC requirement in any country. And you will not pay any maintenance contract for any company at the end of the year, because, and that's that's why the MOH in Palestine adopted the DHIS2, while they are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for other software in the hospital and other uh, uh, healthcare settings. But for the DHIS2, since 2015 till now, uh, they are utilizing the core DHIS2. And one of the uh, crucial and important uh, uh, factor for sustaining the DHIS2 in any country is to adopt the core DHIS2 uh, without any customization, because customization means dependency on other uh, uh, extra hand from outside and from the developers or from, uh, from outside the Ministry of Health, which is against the sustainability and maintainability of the system. Sorry if I uh, have uh, maybe five minutes uh, extra, but yani, that's, that's the whole, uh, story in, in, in a quickly way. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marvin. Oh, a round of applause, yes, for, for Marvin. I yeah. predict a lot of questions because there was uh, so much there, but I was going to try just because our, our presenters really wish you could have been with us here in person, but I'll at least try to turn on the camera here so you can see the room and oh. then maybe we can have some, uh, some conversations if this works at all. So, it's looking very blurry, but that's my um, best attempt to, <laughs> to see the room. And uh, Mohammed, if you maybe, well, no, you can go ahead and leave your slides on the screen. I was going to say that uh, we'd be happy to have you and uh, our other presenters turn on your cameras at some point to say hello as well. But uh, maybe at this point, uh, I have a lot of questions I could ask, but I'd, I'd rather hear from the, the audience uh, if anybody has a starting point. There has to be somebody that wants to say Tracker is not an EHR. Yeah, <laughs> that's why okay, I, I see that. I see a question here. So maybe uh, you'll be able to respond to that. Yeah. Can I answer? Just uh, I'm handing it over for the question. Oh, okay, okay. Hello, Mohammed. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a very fantastic presentation, very insightful and actually very encouraging. Um, I like you to speak a little bit to the audience about saying that Tracker is an EHR, because to be honest, we know EHRs as very yeah. high intensity records with a lot of interaction data, especially if inpatient or outpatient. So we would 
prefer, I would prefer that you delineate a little bit the difference between TRACA and EHR. For me, TRACA is a smart EHR. It's not your standard thinking of what electronic health records are needed at the facility level for patient management. I'll, I'll stop there and pass it over to Mike. Yep. Can I answer now? Yes, please. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, uh, really, I... Um, that's why that's why I, I, I mentioned uh, we call it THR because um, in the hospital we have an EMR electronic medical record because there is an inventory and there is um, a stock in the, uh, a stock management system etc. So uh, in the primary healthcare setting we call EHR electronic health record because we compile all digital health services all healthcare services let me say that all healthcare services. Uh, 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 in digitalized mode in one place, in one instance, by using one unified identifier, the unique identifier, the Palestinian ID, in one database, and you can navigate all the program from one place. So if the definition, okay, officially, this is a tracker, yes. But um, uh, in the branding uh, wise, branding wise, if you call it EHR and compare the function between two other two two um, uh, two things, you can see that the countries you can they can utilize it uh, at that way. But really, yes, okay, yani you can use the, the term. You see it um, uh, in the way you you need to see. But at least it it serves uh, it serves. Uh, uh, um, the all functions you needed uh, um, on country level. So I, I don't know if I answered that. No, uh, thank you. I think we have a follow up here. Yeah, actually, thank you so much, Mohammed, for the presentation. Uh, actually, for me, myself, when I'm uh, trying to make a line or draw a line between the tracker and the uh, uh, electronic medical record. I'm asking the list of the indicators. And when I have the indicators, I'm asking how many more field of data I am collecting compared to this. Because the main purpose of tracker is to make sure that you are receiving very essential information and not making it a, you know, a long list of the data that uh, makes it, uh, uh, makes it uh, almost impossible for many many facilities with a lot of burden of patients to handle this. I don't know about the Palestinian uh, situation, but uh, many uh, other facilities are suffering from the shortage of human resource. And when you are doing this, I have uh, uh, several examples. Uh, when you are asking them to complete all those fields and click all, all those items, uh, checkbox, dropbox, and many other things, in the end of the day, what you are receiving is a low quality of data, which is not uh, even answering the uh, primary purpose of the developing this system. What I'm asking now is, have you done any time analysis and uh, how much uh, per, or, or, uh, time analysis or even click analysis, how many clicks they have to do to finalize a file or how, many, how much time they have to spend to, uh, to, to, to enter the data for one specific patient. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Uh, Mohammed, it, it, seems, it seems we had one person that wanted to follow up quickly to that, and then I'll let you, you speak. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. Before he answers that one, I wanted to understand if this system is used at point of care or they enter the data retrospectively at some time later. All right, go ahead now, Mohammed. Yep, thank you. Um, in fact, um, we uh, agreed with the Minister of Health to have what is called uh, uh, a design review, okay, design review workshop, where we, we will um, uh, review all uh, metadata and data elements uh, in a workshop and to agree or to minimize the level of data entry. Because one of the issues we faced at the beginning, the Ministry of Health insist, insist to uh, reflect all data elements in the paper file into, into the, 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 the electronic system. We try many times to convince, okay, uh, let us just focus on the minimum data sets or on the data that are essential for the doctor 
to 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 fill it. They insist, oh, this is a medical file, legal file. So all uh, data available in the paper-based form should be uh, uh, should be configured inside the system uh, as is. But after that, uh, they find their self. They have many clicks, ten of the clicks just to finalize the uh, the record and they are looking for certain data element not all data elements so they return uh, us to back okay uh, can you please just now do the review that you proposed for us at the beginning and now we are at that position now we are standing here just we need to uh, review uh, all data elements uh, inside the, uh, the the system and propose a minimum data element uh, just to minimize the number of clicks and the number the, the, the navigation uh, uh, cycle inside the system because just I agree with you it's long because that's the requirement but it affects the implementation yes I agree with you and that's why now we agree together with the Ministry of Health to to revisit the the previous design and propose a new design with uh, minimal data entry. Uh, sorry about the second question, Mike, about uh, or a complimentary comment. I, I didn't get it. It was, it was just to clarify that this is being used at the point of care and is not secondary data entry? Yes, it's a primary health care. In Palestine, this is the way we utilize it in the primary health care setting. Uh, because uh, we are lucky at the beginning, they don't have any electronic system. So the only technology available in the primary health care clinics in West Bank, uh, it's the DHIS2. Uh, and in the hospital, they have a Turkish system called the Visanna uh, system. So yes, it's in primary health care and hospital, we don't have uh, DHIS2. And, and they are entering the data into the system directly or are they still capturing on paper first? Uh, no, they are entering the data while they are encountering the, uh, uh, the, uh, the patient. So the, the patient will come to the clinic and while the doctor talking uh, with the um, with the patient, he uh, has an eye contact for both for the computer to do data entry and for the patient as well. So it's not retrospective data entry; it's real time data entry. While the episode of care is running and uh, active, so the data entry is uh, 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 done uh, automatic uh, in real time mode. Yes, thanks. And and I, I can say just because I'm very familiar with this implementation, the starting point also was with a research project, uh, working with the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. Yeah. And as part of that, there was a long period of time of doing the formative research before uh, working on the A and C component of this, which was their starting point, uh, including doing time and motion studies and working with them. And so one of the most significant findings was that you can't do this and paper. And so that was from the beginning, a, a plan about how to phase out paper. And that was before moving on to this system. So just saying that's a, it's a fairly stark, I think, contrast if you're trying to have them enter everything on paper and into a system like this. But I, I have a, another question here that uh, perhaps is a follow up. Sure. Uh, Mohammed, uh, congratulations to you and the team. I think this is like a very impressive uh, setup. I think we saw it last year as well. Um, my I have a few questions. The first is linked to the uh, tracker EHR kind of debate. Um, uh, the biggest challenge of, or uh, the main characteristic of uh, EHR is really, or the hard part is a data dictionary. So I'm, I'm curious what kind of uh, uh, standards, uh, vocabularies you're using, uh, perhaps ICD-10, but maybe more complex uh, SNOMED CT um, and how that's implemented uh, with your setup. And if you are going paperless, I wonder how you're handling things like growth monitoring, for example. Um, my maybe second question is when you're having uh, a unique patient enrolled in multiple tracker programs, uh, assuming uh, you're completely online, have you had any issues with multiple people accessing uh, mm -hmm. or updating the same patient in different uh, tracker programs? 
Mm -hmm. Okay, let me start with the last question about the concurrent user. If, if you're asking about the concurrent users or the online uh, data entry, uh, we have uh, more than uh, um, for all the programs, you can see, you can say we have more than 600 uh, concurrent users, uh, sometimes reached to 800, it depends on the service, and for other service reached for 1,000 concurrent users on the same time are logging into the system for, for the data entry because I mentioned it's we have 380 clinics are utilizing the, uh, uh, for example, MCH and for the other program as well. So uh, yes, um, uh, we have concurrent users. The concurrent users are, are logging in the same time. Uh, the internet uh, at the beginning was a challenge, but finally we solve it because Ministry of Health with Ministry of uh, Telecom, uh, in for, uh, teleco uh, Telecommunication uh, Ministry, they convinced and agreed at the end, yes, this is a real investment, so we will upgrade the internet speed, and um, really they, they, they upgraded to, to good level for time being. Um, as for the offline solution, uh, we don't have that solution. We have a backup procedure, uh, like a standby procedure. The standby procedure, if the internet is connected or the electric city is connected, you know, we are living in Palestine and there is an Israeli occupation. And uh, some, some issues happened really, uh, to be realistic. Uh, so we have a paper based, are already printed and distributed for the clinics to be used uh, at that time, if the internet or uh, electricity happened, but really it's it's very rare. Yani it's not happened uh, frequently, and that's why they adopted the system. If happened frequently and they need to recapture uh, or re-enter the data, no, they will uh, uh, they will uh, yani, uh, not decide to to use the system. But uh, really now uh, uh, they adopted because. The, the offline solution, the, the 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 level of data entry is uh, is not an issue uh, for them. And for the classification, ICD-10, the medical coding, yes, we utilize the we already uh, configured the uh, ICD-10 in the system, and the, the CPT uh, current procedural terminology for the lab for the laboratory. Uh, all these are added in the system as an option set and already conf configured inside the system. As for other data elements, in fact, we utilized what is called the Palestinian Health Data Dictionary, was uh, uh, developed and published in 2500, uh, two, 2005. It need, uh, it need upgrade, but at least this is the official dictionary we have in Palestine, but we added many from WHO and from CDC. Great, thanks. And we have a, at least one more question. And just a warning, our uh, microphone here is about to die of battery. So if we go silent for a minute, just give me a minute to fix it. OK, OK. Thank you. Time. Hi, Mohammed. Thanks. Uh, the system, uh, from what I saw, or part of what I saw, it seems very comprehensive and it's great. I, I do, however, maybe I might have missed it. Uh, I wanted to find out how do you guys verify your clients do you have a separate system or you're using DHIS to verify that the client that you're serving at that time is the same one? I know that when we started off, when you start off with paper, a client comes in, they sign a piece of paper, then you those there, there are those details. So how have you been able to overcome that? Maybe I might have missed it if, if you mentioned it. Uh, if I understand you well, um, if, is there an alternative of DHIS2 or what is that your exact question? Please. So I'm, I'm uh, testing out a new that? microphone. Can, can you hear me, Mohammed? Yes, yes, very well. Okay, I but just I... switched microphones, so I'll, I'll, I'll allow a clarification. Right, I'm saying, even if you're using DH, right now, what are you using to verify that the client that you, has been admitted is the client who's supposedly registered before? That's basically what I'm asking. Oh yes, because we have one database and one instance. So once the, the the patient is admitted or has an outpatient visit inside the primary healthcare setting, all of them are on one, on one database. So you can do a query. The system will present all previous record for the same patient. And what so what do you use as what do you use as the unique identifier? 
Yes, uh, the ID, national ID. It's nine digits from the Ministry of Interior, uh, like a, a national ID for all uh, citizens. It's a unique identifier, and the same identifier are used in the hospital. Even both system is not connected yet. We don't have interoperability between primary and secondary care, but at least both of them are using the same identifier. So if any patient go for any clinic in the West Bank, in the around 400 clinics, the same record you can navigate from uh, by using the same unique ID. And I, I, know. I know we're, we're, thank you, Mama. that's great. I know we're going to run out of time, but we, of course, we have one of your uh, former colleagues with us, Hanin. So I thought I would give Hanin a chance also to yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> make a comment. Yes, yes. And also this way, after the session, people know who to come to ask additional questions to. So, Hanin. Yes, Hanin is a good yeah. messenger for Palestine and uh, for the DHIS2 story in Palestine. Welcome, Hanin. Thank you. Thank you, Muhammad. So... I would like to thank you for this great presentation. It's a huge effort. So for this regard, um, I, it's not a question, but it's more like a request. Uh, if you could make like a, a short demo video and send it to us, maybe we can put it somewhere at the community uh, of practice. Because uh, when I started here in the HISP Center dealing with uh, many countries in the Middle East region, they started to ask me a lot about the workflow of the system uh, mm. and they want to know more. So if you can please just, if it's applicable to uh, do or to make a short video and we can uh, put it in the community so all countries who are interested, maybe they can uh, look at it and uh, maybe to have like an idea of the system. And once again, thank you. Thank you for this great presentation. So what it's a huge, uh, huge effort. And thank you also for the Palestinian team. Yeah, thank you, Hanin. And really, we will, uh, inshallah, work on that uh, video and make it on our uh, uh, YouTube uh, channel. And uh, so it, it's going to be easy to, to navigate through the YouTube, maybe. So definitely. And thank you, Mike, Hanin, and UIO for, um, for, for having us in this uh, uh, great DAC 2023. And hopefully, DAC 24, I will be with you. <laughs> inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you, yes, everyone. Inshallah. You'd uh, give Muhammad uh, another round of applause and also the FHI 360 team from Nepal. So, of course, uh, as I mentioned, you can follow up with Hanin Abdul Rahman, also is familiar with the system. There are people that you can ask some additional questions about uh, the Palestinian system. I'm also happy to talk with you. We can always have the EHR tracker conversation uh, additionally. Also wanted to thank again the, the team from Nepal uh, so much for joining. And apologies to both of you that we were not able to do this in person, but we really do hope uh, 2024 that you can join us. So thank you again, everybody, and uh, we'll finish here. Thank you.